باسم الاب والابن والروح القدس الاله الواحد امين تحل علينا نعمته وبركته ومعونته من الان والى ابد الابدين كلها ابائي واخواتي امين يشرفنا ويباركنا ان يكون معنا للتدريس في مدرسه تيرانوس في مرات عده هذه عددها ابونا بيتر فرانكتون كاهن كنيسه العذراء والقديس كيرولوس في ليفربول في اليونايتد ستيت في المملكه المتحده في انجلترا ابونا مدرس للاهوت والابائيات بمدرسه تيرانس وله العديد من الكتب والمؤلفات التي اثر بها المكتبه المسيحيه في هذا المجال سنستمع الى العديد من المحاضرات له في مدرسه تيرانس وهو متخصص ولديه شهادات في مجال الابحاث اللاهوتيه والابائيه شكرا لابونا بيتر فرانكتون وعلى عمله الدؤوب معنا في مدرسه تيرانس وعلى اهتمامه ان يقدم لنا من زخم فكره جددا وعتقاء ربنا يستخدم هذه الكلمات يستخدم هذه المحاضرات وهذه التعليم من اجل اسراء الفكر القبطي المعاصر في كنيستنا ومن اجل نقل الخبره والتفسير والشرح والبناء اللاهوتي والعقيدي لاخواتنا وسادتنا من الطلبه في المدرسه في كل انحاء العالم مجد اسم ربنا القدوس الان كل اوان الى دهر الدور كلها امين In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit one God amen In this lecture I hope that we can consider together the life and one of the writings of St Hilary of Poitiers one of the western fathers uh, who spoke latin rather than greek and who transmitted the orthodox faith in an authoritative manner uh, in the western provinces of the roman empire uh, he was born in about 310 ad in the city of poitiers which is in modern day france and he died in about 367 ad This makes him a contemporary of St Athanasius of Alexandria who was born a little before him in 297 AD and died a little after him in 373 AD. Uh, St Hilary had a pagan upbringing and it was as a well established uh, relatively wealthy adult of the city of Poitiers that he converted to orthodox Christianity after studying the Jewish and Christian scriptures. and as a result of his devotion and his holiness and his manner of life he was made bishop of Poitiers in 353 AD immediately he began to resist the heresy of arianism we might rather expect that after the council of nicaea in 325 AD we would hear no more of arianism uh, but in fact it was in the period between the council of nicaea and the council of constantinople in 381 ad that arianism gained its greatest strength uh, many of the emperors of the roman empire at this time adopted the heresy of arianism uh, and it was difficult on many occasions for those who preserved the orthodox faith to remain in their sees st athanasius himself was exiled many times uh, as a result of opposition from emperors and other bishops who had adopted this heresy uh, in Poitiers and the region around it Hilary as a bishop of some authority was able to depose several of those who held the Arian faith and he complained in writing to the emperor Constantius II about the persecution which those who held to the orthodox catholic faith were facing at the hands of Arians he caused so much disturbance that many of those who opposed him and who held the arian views uh, complained to the emperor and brought about his own exile uh, he was summoned to a council and he refused to condemn st athanasius of alexandria and therefore he was sent to phrygia in asia minor in 356 ad it was at this time when he found himself in the greek speaking east that he especially came to understand in some detail the controversies around the doctrine of the holy trinity 
Before this, he had held to an orthodox faith, certainly, but the details which were transmitted in arguments made in Greek were not entirely clear to him. But the number of years which he spent in exile uh, produced a deep understanding, and he clearly and resolutely took the side of the orthodox understanding of the Holy Trinity. Uh, during his time there in exile, uh, he wrote several works. One of them was called De Fide Orientalium, which means concerning the Eastern faith. Uh, and this took the form especially of a letter which he sent to the bishops in the West to explain more clearly what it was that the Eastern bishops and the Eastern Church were trying to say in their description of the Holy Trinity and in the relationship of the Father and the Son. Uh, he also wrote this major work, which we will consider today, De Trinitate, on the Holy Trinity. Uh, he caused so much trouble in the East where he defended the Orthodox faith so strongly that in 361 he was sent back to Poitiers. Uh, he was uh, the, the master of uh, St. Martin of Tours, who was beginning to establish the monastic life in France. And St. Martin established one of his first monasteries in Poitiers in 361 AD when St. Hilary returned. Uh, St. Martin had learned the faith from St. Hilary and remained a close friend of his throughout the rest of his life. Uh, he continued to oppose Arianism in the last few years of his life, and as we have already seen, uh, he departed in 367 AD. He had a strong and high reputation in his own time, and he has come to be known as the Hammer of the Arians, the Malleus Arianorum, uh, by several writers. Uh, he has also been described as the Athanasius of the West, since he held so strongly and firmly onto the orthodox understanding of the Holy Trinity uh, and suffered exile and persecution as a result of it. Uh, Augustine of Hippo calls him the illustrious teacher of the churches and had a very high opinion of him. In fact, he was the first Latin hymn writer, or at least the first Latin hymn writer whose works have come down to us. Uh, he wrote some hymns in Latin, which he sent to his daughter. He had an adult daughter when he was made bishop. Uh, and these were hymns to be sung in the morning and the evening. And he was buried in Poitiers, where he had been the bishop. And his relics were sent to many different places because of the veneration and respect in which he was held. Uh, at the time of the Protestants, uh, his tomb was destroyed and the relics which remained in Poitiers were scattered. But thanks to the fact that his relics were held in other places, some of them were restored in later centuries, and still in Poitiers, uh, his holy remains can be venerated. Uh, here, briefly, is a map showing us where Poitiers is. Uh, and we can see from this that uh, Hilary is entirely a Western saint. Uh, I, I don't mean that uh, he doesn't deserve the veneration which I hope uh, we will come to give him through studying his words. Uh, but he was a Latin speaker uh, and he lived and he died uh, in the middle of France uh, and it was only during his exile that he had any experience of communicating with and, and having communion with the Eastern Fathers and teachers of the Church. Uh, if you can see clearly and carefully in the map just a little north of where the mark is, uh, is the city of Tours uh, and Tours is where St. Martin uh, eventually established his major monasteries uh, and St. Martin is venerated in our own Synax area. Uh, we have a connection, even as Coptic Orthodox Christians, with many of these great saints, uh, even if uh, it is only in that they defended uh, our own fathers, such as St. Athanasius, when they faced opposition. Uh, St. Hilary was engaged in the same conflict as St. Athanasius, and his writings, as we will come to see in just a moment, deal with many of the same issues. The book we are going to consider today is On the Holy Trinity, and it's written in 12 sections, and in an English translation which is available to us, it takes up 500 pages. Of course, there is no way that we can study this whole book in detail in just a short lecture. 
Uh, and so what we are going to do in this study is to consider in some detail book one where Hillary explains how he is going to unfold his argument in the rest of his book. And this will give us some idea of what he says throughout his text, and it will give us a very clear idea of how he wants to present his argument, what he considers to be important, uh, and how it is that he comes to have this particular uh, insistence on the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Uh, in the first of these books, he begins with the reasons for writing it, and we will look at those in a minute. Uh, and then, fortunately, in, in book one, he describes himself in his own words the content of his work. And so by studying carefully book one, we can, in his own words, come to understand the argument which unfolds throughout the rest of the pages. Uh, we're going to look, first of all, at how it was that he came to discover the Christian faith, uh, and to have a faith in the Holy Trinity as it is expressed and explained in the Orthodox Church. Uh, and throughout the rest of these slides, I will read a very short passage uh, from Book One in this work on the Holy Trinity, and then we will reflect on it briefly to see what we learn about St. Hilary uh, and about his faith. Uh, here is the first excerpt. When I was in search of an employment proper to man and sacred, which by its nature or through the researches of prudent men would result in something worthy of this divine gift that has been bestowed upon him for knowledge, many things came to my mind. The possession of leisure together with riches. They do not seem to differ much from the pleasures of animals. What do we see here? Uh, St. Hilary is trying to explain to us how it is that he comes to be a Christian and that he comes to be writing this book on the Holy Trinity. And first of all, he describes a time in his life when, as a relatively wealthy man of some importance, he was asking, what shall I do with my life? How shall I occupy myself? Uh, and he looked at all of the things that he could be doing, and we'll see some others in a moment. And the first thing that he saw he could do with his life is to enjoy his leisure because he was a rich man. Uh, and to satisfy himself with a variety of pleasures. And yet when he reflects on this, uh, and when he thinks back to his own life as a pagan, he realised that this was entirely unsatisfactory. Because to live such a life is to be no different from the animals. Uh, and if you are able to uh, get a copy of his work on the Holy Trinity, he uses the examples of animals who don't have very great worries in their lives, they have enough to eat, uh, they sleep, uh, they have children, uh, that's all that's given over to the life of an animal. And he wonders to himself, is this really what human beings are made for? To have a life that is no different to that of an animal, simply enjoying leisure uh, through having wealth and riches. Uh, and it's something that he turns from, even as a pagan, that this is unsatisfying to someone who has any thoughtfulness about their life. He says this, My soul, however, having rejected the idea of simply enjoying leisure and pleasure, hastened not only to good deeds and thoughts, which if I had not done I would have been filled with guilt and remorse, but also to know this God. My soul, therefore, was enkindled with the most ardent desire of comprehending and knowing him. Many of them introduced numerous families of uncertain deities, or said that there was a God, but asserted that this same God had no concern or interest in human affairs. What do we learn here? Uh, he had abandoned the idea of giving himself only up to leisure, and it seemed to him that God had given him life to do something useful with it. Uh, and he realised that he could give himself to doing works of virtue, good deeds, he could be a good man, but that wasn't enough for him. If there was a God who had made him, it was necessary for him to do good things anyhow. Uh, there is a sense in the Roman language, in Latin, that virtue is something that belongs to a man. Uh, the word virtue contains at the beginning of that word the Latin verb vir, which means man. And so virtue, or acting in a good way, is the behaviour that is expected of a man, uh, rather than an animal. 
Uh, and, and so it wasn't just the searching for virtue that could satisfy him, since any good man, any thoughtful man, would seek to live in such a way. Uh, he realised that he needed to know this God who had made him, if he was to make any sense of his life and to find satisfaction. But when he started to look at uh, which God he might choose to venerate and worship, he saw that there were so many. Uh, and many of the people around him to whom uh, he entered into conversation about these things presented him with all manner of gods, uh, families of gods even. Uh, and there were others who said that there was a God, but he wasn't interested in human affairs. And so St. Hilary, in his journey towards the truth, passed through this phase where the pagan deities presented to him as a possibility uh, were unable to satisfy him in his seeking and his desire after God. Nor did the idea that God had made him but had no interest him sa in him satisfy him. It seemed to him that if there was a God who had made him, it was a God who wanted him to experience uh, and know him in some way. Uh, and then after several other passages in his book, he comes to this important passage. I chanced upon those books which, according to Jewish tradition, were written by Moses and the prophets. In them I found the testimony of God the Creator about himself, expressed in the following manner, I am who I am. After becoming familiar with the law and the prophets, it learned about the promises of the evangelical and apostolic doctrine. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what was the changing point uh, for St. Hilary? Um, coming from a wealthy pagan family, it was that he came upon the scriptures. Uh, those scriptures we call the Old Testament, written by Moses and the prophets, uh, and then the teaching of the apostles. Uh, and it was in these that he found that truth, that insight, uh, which drew his heart and made him feel that there was some possibility of knowing the God who had revealed himself as I am who I am. Uh, I think this is important uh, to find this passage at the beginning of a work of theology. We often seem, it seems to me, to imagine that a work of theology is filled with philosophy uh, and Greek terms and difficult ideas, uh, and certainly they can be. But for the early fathers of the church, uh, for the fathers of the 4th and 5th, even into the 6th century, as late as St Severus, it was the scriptures which revealed Christ to them. It was the scriptures which revealed true doctrine to them. And it seems to me that as Orthodox Christians in our Coptic Orthodox tradition, we also need to become men and women of the Bible in the same way, so that we find in the writings of Scripture the truth about God and about Jesus Christ, which our theology represents. Not that we begin with works of theology and then in a secondary way, as if not so important, we turn to the Scriptures to find proofs for what we have already decided, but by knowing the scriptures and reflecting on the scriptures prayerfully, as St. Hilary has done in his own life and experience, we begin the journey of knowing the God about whom they declare. And so this is a first important point about the way in which St. Hilary does theology. Uh, he does it on the basis of an understanding and an experience and a respect for the Holy Scriptures. Uh, much of his theology is an expression of the Holy Scriptures. It is not an expression of abstruse philosophy separated from the Scriptures. And this must be the same for us if we wish to study theology and be those who write about theology. We must be those who live out our understanding and experience of the Scriptures. And we must become much more rooted in the words of Moses and the prophets and in the Apostles. Then he says, My fearful and anxious soul found greater hope than it had anticipated. First of all it received the knowledge of God the Father. Nor does it accept a difference in nature between God and God, because it learns that the God who is from God is full of grace and truth. 
nor does it imagine that there is an earlier and later God from God. Those who do receive him are raised to be sons of God, not by a birth from the flesh, but by faith. Here we find, perhaps we can say, a theological passage. Uh, and he is writing about the heresy of Arius. Because it was Arius who wished to introduce a difference between the nature of God the Father and the nature of God the Son. So that God the Son was not clearly and truly of the same essence as God the Father. And yet how does he place this theological concept? Uh, it is within a passage where he is speaking about his own experience and where he is speaking about our experience. And just as our theological inquiry must be rooted in the scriptures, so our theological inquiry and understanding must develop out of the experience of faith which we have towards God. It must not be a purely intellectual exercise done with our mind, but it must be done something within the depths of our heart. So that what we say about God is what we have learned directly from our experience of him. Uh, and we see this from the beginning where St. Hilary says, My soul found hope because my soul received the knowledge of God the Father, not just his mind. And more than that, when he speaks about us, uh, he says that those who receive him, those who enter into a relationship with God, are raised themselves to be sons of God. So we also, in our own experience, are to understand in a personal manner, by faith, by grace, what it means to become a son of God. Uh, so these two things bracket this theological concept in the middle. Uh, it is in our experience and our personal knowledge of God that our theology comes alive and it cannot be separated from this personal knowledge and experience. Then he says, A firm faith rejects the useless questions of philosophy, nor does truth become the victim of falsehood by yielding to the fallacies of human absurdities. It does not confine God within the terms of ordinary understanding, nor does it judge of Christ, in whom dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily according to the elements of the world, so that the power of eternal infinity surpasses the comprehension of the earthly mind. Here is one of the great minds of his time, one of the geniuses of the fourth century, especially in Western Europe, uh, and yet it is by faith that he speaks about these things. It is by faith that he apprehends the truth and the knowledge about the Holy Trinity and about Christ, because he rejects the useless questions of philosophy, and he does not give way to the fallacies of human absurdities. Uh, he doesn't want to bind his understanding of God with the limitations of the human mind. And much of the heresy that we see and understand in our Orthodox Church history is rooted in these questions of philosophy or in human absurdities. Most of the heresies come about because the mind is made sovereign over our understanding of God. I'm thinking especially of Nestorius, for instance who says with his mind, I will never say that the baby born of the Virgin Mary is God. It was more than his mind could comprehend. And so because he could not comprehend it with his mind, he refused to accept it as a truth. And yet this is the opposite of what we read here from St. Hilary, who by faith accepts these things because he finds them written in the Holy Scriptures. Uh, he abandons the control of the mind, not so that our thought is unreasonable, but so that we do not allow our mind and our intellect to judge the revelation of God which he has made of himself. So it is beyond ordinary understanding to speak about how God has become a man. It is not without the possibility of reason, but it's beyond our understanding to comprehend it. Uh, and we cannot make ourselves the judge of Christ so that our explanation of how God has become man fits into uh, our rationality. 
because the eternal infinity God who has worked in this way to make himself man is beyond the comprehension of our earthly mind and so with St Hilary we read the scriptures and we find it said that the word became flesh and in faith we apprehend and take hold of those words we do not place them uh, under the judgment of our mind and say this makes no sense it must mean this uh, rather with St Hilary we say truly I believe this is what has happened God has become flesh I do not know how it happened but this is what I believe has happened and so here is another aspect of how we are to do theology we are not to elevate our mind above the revelation of God we need not be unreasonable or unirrational uh, our, our ideas should make sense but we must know where to be silent before the revelation of God we must know where we have to say this is a matter of faith uh, and not of intellect as St Hilary teaches us now he starts to talk about one or two of the heresies which were important in his time uh, and he's writing in the fourth century uh, and there were several important heresies which were still prevalent one of them uh, this first one is modalism which you may well know all about uh, and he speaks about those who take what is in the scriptures and twist it uh, to suit their own intellectual thoughts so that it makes sense to them so that they don't need faith because they have comprehended it and he says this there are certain individuals who so distort the mystery of the evangelical faith that they deny the birth of the only begotten God while piously professing that there is only one God that there is an extension rather than a descent into man that he who became the son of man from the moment he assumed our face flesh never existed previously and is not the son of God in order to preserve intact our faith in the one God the father who has extended himself even to the virgin and is born as the son now there were a variety of forms of modalism but the essential characteristic of all of them is that there was really only one God uh, and that this God was not a holy trinity of father son and holy spirit uh, but that he acted in various ways which we call the son and he acted in various ways that we call the spirit uh, and there were two types of modalism uh, one of them said and he's speaking about this here that the father himself uh, influenced the man Jesus Jesus was born in an ordinary way as a baby and at some point probably from the baptism was usually when these heretics took it from the moment he was baptized God the father came upon him and began to inspire him and work through him uh, and it was God the father who was in Jesus Christ because the heretics wish to preserve this idea of there being only one God another aspect of heresy that we need to think about is not only that generally uh, the teachings of scripture and of the church are made to be submitted to the mind but another aspect of heresy uh, is usually that there is one aspect of the faith which is taken to an extreme and so here in modalism the idea that there was one God which is true was taken to an extreme so that it denied that there was a son and the spirit in any meaningful way uh, there is another type of modalism that says that there is also only one God but that sometimes he puts on a mask and appears as the son and sometimes he puts on a mask and appears as the spirit but really it's the one God who is doing this and there isn't really a son and there isn't really a spirit there isn't really a father there's just a God who is pretending to be different persons and these persons don't really exist uh, and so here St Hilary is complaining that some individuals distort the faith uh, that means that they begin with the faith and then they twist it and we see this in our own time and in every time uh, there are those outside of the church who have a faith which is completely different uh, it would be very hard for us to be convinced by a Hindu uh, or a Buddhist even 
because their faith is so entirely different. But there are others who take the faith and then twist it in a certain way so that it loses something important. And it still seems to a simple person on the outside that it's the same faith. But really something important has broken and it's not the same faith at all. Uh, and so here the modalists, uh, as St. Hilary is combating them, uh, he understands as someone coming from a pagan background who has studied the scriptures uh, that it's possible to take what is written in the scriptures and distort it so that it says something else. Uh, and here they were saying, yes, the church has always believed in one God. We also believe in one God. And this is how we explain it. The Son of God is a man and God the Father hovers over him and inspires him. And in this way we call him the Son. But really he isn't the Son of God. He's not divine at all. And really there isn't any person called the Son. There is only God. And so if the one who hangs on the cross and dies and is resurrected is not truly God and is not truly a divine person, then our salvation comes to nothing. It is a man inspired by God who has died on the cross. Uh, secondly, he wants to attack uh, and oppose the teachings of Arianism. Uh, and just as modalism was perhaps dying off in his time, Arianism was really taking off. Uh, and Arianism had so much power that uh, the bishops could gain the ear of the emperors and could uh, bring about the exile of many of those who held the Orthodox faith, such as St. Hilary and such as St. Athanasius. He says this, there are others, and now he's speaking about Arians. On the contrary, since there is no salvation without him who as God the Word was with God in the beginning, who, while denying the birth, have acknowledged creation alone, so that the birth does not admit the true nature of God, and creation teaches that he is a false God. In place of the true birth, they substitute the name and faith of creation, and separate him from the true nature of the one God, in order that a creature may not usurp the perfection of the Godhead, which had not been given by the birth of a true nature. Uh, this is a little bit complicated, so let's look at it a section at a time. First of all, he says, there are those who understand that there is no salvation without God the Word. And the Arians believed in God the Word, and that was a good thing. He was another group of people who agreed with many aspects of the Orthodox faith. And it looked to many people that they had the same faith. Many of the Empires were Arians because they couldn't quite understand what was all the argument about. And so the Arians also believed that there was a God the Word who was with God in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. But the problem is what they thought about this Word. Uh, and here, St. Hilary uses the words birth and creation. Uh, he wishes to use the word birth about how it is that the word of God comes from God the Father in eternity. And the Arians denied this. The Arians denied that God the word came from God, came from his own nature. What the Arians did acknowledge was that God had created the word. Before all time, before anything else was made, God had made the word and in fact they believed that it was the word of God who then went on to make everything else and so for the Arians God the word was very important he was very close to God he was like God he had been made by God's own hands we could say but he wasn't God because he had not been born from God or begotten from God as we say he had been created by God and so if they denied that the word was begotten or born from God in, it, in eternity, then he wasn't really God at all. If God had made him, then he wasn't like God in anything. And so the Arians confused people by saying that we do believe that he is God from God. They did believe in words like that. But when they said that the word was God from God, they meant something very different to what St. Hilary and St. Athanasius meant. Because St. Hilary and St. Athanasius meant that he had been begotten from God and therefore was of the same nature as God. 
Whereas Arius meant that he was a bit like God because he had been made by God and given great powers and was the agent of creation. But these are completely different things. And again, we see St. Hilary is very clear. He understands behind the Arians' ideas is this sense that we must preserve the oneness of God. Uh, and again, that is a Christian and an orthodox perspective. We also wish to preserve the oneness of God. But Arius and those who followed him destroyed everything by failing to understand how it is that the Holy Trinity is a perfection of three divine persons in one divine nature or essence. And so they took this oneness and in a different way to the modalists but equally damaging for our salvation. Uh, they said that God the Word was not really God at all. He was just like God. But if it was only someone who was just like God who died on the cross, then he cannot be our saviour. And he cannot make us true sons of God. He can only make us like himself, those who aren't really connected to God at all and are completely separated from God by being created, uh, even as the greatest of his creations. What is St. Hilary's response? He says, It is necessary for salvation to believe in God, but also in God the Father. Not only to hope in Christ, but to hope in Christ as the Son of God. And not as a creature, but as God the Creator who was born from God. Therefore, relying for the most part on the testimonies of the prophets and the Gospels, we hasten to refute the madness and ignorance of those who by this teaching of the one God as the only doctrine that is useful and reverential either deny that Christ was born as God or contend that he is not the true God. So here St. Hilary is beginning to explain what's going to fill the rest of his book. And if you remember we're looking only at book one in this lecture. Uh, the rest of the book through 500 pages uh, will explain in more detail what he is saying he is going to describe here. It is necessary for our salvation to believe in God. And the Arians and the modalists believed in God. But it is also necessary for us to believe in God the Father. And neither the modalists nor the Arians really believed that God was a father. Uh, God was either uh, someone putting on a mask at different times and not really the father at all. Or he was not the father of the word, but the creator of the word. Uh, St. Hilary says, we have to have a hope in Christ. And we can say that the Arians and the modalists valued and respected the person of Christ, even though they really thought uh, that he was not God made flesh. But we have to do more than that, St. Hilary is saying. We have to hope in Christ as the son of God. And of course, even the Arians and the modalists were able to use those words son of God in their own way. But St. Hilary means we must really believe that Jesus Christ is God himself. Not a creature, not a creature who has been made, but God the creator who was born from God, who was begotten from God, who shares the same nature as God. So it is not enough, even in our modern times, to say it's good that others believe this or believe that. Of course it's good. But it is possible to believe this or that and also believe something or believe in a way that completely undermines the Christian faith entirely. We have to believe completely. Uh, and each one of us as Orthodox Christians has to believe the whole of the faith and not just parts of the faith. Uh, otherwise we will find ourselves deceived and led astray. How is St. Hilary going to respond? How is he going to explain his understanding of salvation in an orthodox manner? He says here in this passage, he is going to rely, for the most part, on the testimony of the prophets and the Gospels. And again, I want to suggest that this is something that we who are seeking to study the theology of the Church must also do. We must be those who do not turn most of all, for the most part, to the writings of later people. We must also be those who turn, for the most part, to the testimony of the prophets and the Gospels. 
And in fact, most of the early writers of the church, I'm thinking of St. Cyril, uh, I'm thinking of St. John Chrysostom, uh, I'm thinking of uh, all of those who try to explain the Christian faith. We discover when we read their words that they are explaining what the scriptures say. They are not writing philosophy. They are not simply producing clever ideas. They are trying to remain rooted in the Holy Scriptures and explain to those who hear him what the Scriptures mean. And this is a necessity, it seems to me, in our own time when we are surrounded by philosophies and ideas, where we are surrounded by false ideas about Christianity. We must return with the fathers of the Church to the Scriptures and beginning with the Scriptures, following the interpretation of the Fathers, we must lay hold of the whole Orthodox faith, not as something intellectual and an exercise for our mind, but as the revelation of God to our heart. And it is only through this returning to the Scriptures and discovering our theology there that we have the power to overcome the false teachers, as St. Hilary intended to do. And here also in this passage, he reminds us, as I've said, the problem with the Arians and the modalists was that they were taking one teaching and blowing it up as if it was the only necessary and useful teaching of the church. And one of the great things about our Orthodox faith is that we have a balance of things. Uh, we have a wide variety of truths that must be held together. And it is in only in holding these things together that we are preserved from falling into error or into excess. And this again only comes from a strong knowledge of the scriptures and a very clear knowledge of the interpretation of many of the fathers. But we also fall into error when the only experience we have of the scriptures and of the fathers is little snippets here and there where we are producing a list of words to make our own arguments stand up. This is never the way that we should deal with theology or with the scriptures. We must read whole books of the scripture to gain the whole argument of the apostles and of the writers and the prophets and Moses. We must read lengthy sections and whole books from our fathers so that we gain an understanding of their whole argument and do not simply use them to take a sentence here and a sentence there to justify what we have already determined. We have to become the students of the scriptures and the fathers and not act as if we were in judgment over them uh, or their masters. What is his argument going to be as he unfolds this book? He says, but we who have been taught by God to proclaim that there are neither two gods nor a solitary one in professing our faith in God the Father and God the Son shall follow the method of instruction used by the Gospels and the Prophets. Namely, that in our creed, both are one nature and not one person, nor do we acknowledge that both are one and the same, nor is there something else between the true and false God, because where God is born from God, the birth does not allow them to be the same, nor something else to be between them. So his whole argument is going to be this, that in the scriptures, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see that God is one, but that we see also that there is a Father and the Son. And he writes a little later about the Spirit. We see in the, in the Holy Scriptures that there is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God. But the, the Scriptures themselves teach us that these are not three gods, or two gods in the case of the Father and the Son. And so it is by the Scriptures that we understand we must avoid these two extremes one of which says that there is only one God, and so the Word and Christ cannot really be God, and the other that says there is a God and there is his Son and these are two gods. We do not believe either of these. Rather, we believe, as we understand the Scriptures to teach us, that the Word and Son of God is so begotten or born, as St. Hilary says, from God before all time, that he is different because he is the Son and not the Father, but he is the same because he shares one nature. Uh, and so here, writing uh, in the 4th century, we find a very clear expression of the creed of Nicaea and of the teaching of the Eastern Fathers and especially of St. Athanasius. And what is the method he's going to use? He writes in this way. 
The best reader is he who looks for the meaning of the words in the words themselves rather than reads his meaning into them, who carries away more than he brought and who does not insist that the words signify what he presupposed before reading them. Therefore, since our treatise will be about the things of God, let us concede to God the knowledge about himself. And let us humbly submit to his words with reverent awe, for he is a competent witness for himself who is not known except by himself. These are wonderful words that all of us who are students of theology uh, should have printed somewhere that we can read them often. The best reader, the best student, is not someone who comes to the words of the scriptures or the words of the fathers and has already decided for themselves what they say or what they must mean. Uh, this is the way that heretics uh, and those who teach error turn to the scriptures and the fathers. Uh, even in our own times, this is how people who have already decided for themselves what the fathers must say approach these authorities so that they come away with a long list of little snippets, little pieces. This is not how we are to read the scriptures and the fathers. We are to come to them so that we learn more from them than we brought to them. I think this is a wonderful image. Uh, to read a book such as this by St. Hilary and allow St. Hilary to speak to us instead of making St. Hilary fit into my own argument. Why should we act in such a way? Why should we come as humble students to the words of the scriptures and the fathers? It is because through them, if we are silent, we can discover that God will speak to us. If we come to read a whole book of the Old Testament, if we read one of the prophets without a whole load of presuppositions, without having in our mind what it already means, then we will find that God himself, who inspired these words, will bring them alive to us and speak to us. And his speaking to us will have the authority of being his own divine voice, rather than the authority only of my own understanding and my own thoughts. And so this is how he is going to approach uh, his argument with the Arians and other heretics of his time, as he explains more fully in his work the teaching that orthodoxy presents of the Holy Trinity. It is not by using clever philosophy. It is not by using his own arguments. It is by turning again and again, especially to the apostles and the prophets, the Old and the New Testament, and to the interpretation of the fathers of the Holy Scriptures. In that way, it is God himself who is allowed to speak for himself. In that way, it is God himself who is allowed to explain and justify himself and reveal himself to the humble of heart, just as those who are proud find themselves caught up in their own imaginations, even as they seek to do the work of theology. Uh, he speaks about analogy and how he is going to use analogy in his book. And this also is a very important passage. If in our study of the nature and birth of God we shall cite some examples for the sake of illustration. The limitations of our knowledge force us to look for certain resemblances in inferior things. In order that, while we are being made aware of familiar and ordinary things, <coughs> we may be drawn from our conscious manner of reasoning to think in a way in which we are not accustomed. Every analogy, therefore, is to be considered as more useful to man than as appropriate to God because it hints at the meaning rather than explains it fully. Many of the controversies in the church uh, and even many of the heresies are rooted in this fact that analogy is not intended to explain or describe everything about God in a comprehensive way. This is impossible for the human mind and heart and thought and words. Rather, we use analogy, taking something from our own experience, to allow us to see by example one aspect uh, where we are only hinting at the meaning uh, of something deep and mysterious and unfathomable in God. Uh, and so we can think of the analogy used in Christology of the piece of iron which has been uh, 
heated in a furnace so that it becomes filled with fire and neither turns into fire uh, neither does it turn into metal but it is metal filled with fire and fiery metal when we understand this is an analogy that is hinting at something we understand its limitations uh, when we start to treat it as a revealed doctrinal truth then we start to run into problems because we are trying to say too much with a simple illustration but we use analogy even today usefully when we understand that it is for our benefit uh, not as if it explains God fully or comprehensively and if we understand that it only hints at a meaning uh, rather than saying something comprehensively about God uh, and then what is his method he says and he writes very clearly and helpfully in book one we have planned our work in such a manner that the books are connected and follow an order that is best adapted for the reader's progress we have decided not to offer anything that was not well coordinated and assimilated we have also so to speak arranged certain beginnings of our ascent in an orderly fashion and have alleviated the arduous journey of knowledge as if it were to a more pleasant elevation we have done so not by cutting out steps but by a gradual slope of the surface so that the walkers are ascending and hardly realize that they are doing so I think this is a wonderful passage especially for those of us engaged uh, in the service of teaching in the church in whatever way uh, firstly it shows that St Hilary has thought carefully about how he is going to write his book so that everything is connected and follows an order for the sake of the progress of the reader so he is not writing for his own benefit and he is not writing in a haphazard manner uh, but he is writing carefully and clearly and with an order and a progress so that the one who reads his book will little by little be taken on a journey with him of understanding uh, and at the bottom of the passage he says he hasn't even written the book as if there are steps that the reader has to climb up but rather that by following the book little by little they discover they are rising up higher and higher in their understanding this is a wonderful way of understanding how we are to be of service in the teaching ministry of the church uh, we are to be thinking of those whom we serve and how we can present the teaching of the church to them in such a way that almost without realizing it uh, they rise up in their knowledge and understanding and experience because we have already prepared the way for them uh, we have already made things easy for them uh, so that they can focus on the words they are reading rather than the struggle of the ascent and that makes up the entirety of book one and we've looked at it in some detail uh, he describes why he is writing his book uh, how he comes to be a Christian and even a bishop uh, he describes his own faith in the orthodox understanding of the Holy Trinity and of Christ as God the Word made man uh, and now at the very end of book one he starts in a few passage a few paragraphs or passages to describe what's going to come in each of those books uh, and we will just look briefly at uh, an extract from each of these paragraphs so that we understand uh, without going through them in the same detail what is contained in each of these books uh, and you have the freedom to return to uh, this text if you can uh, obtain it either as a, a hardback book or as a PDF to see how he unfolds these paragraphs uh, in detail so about book two he says after the present book the first of the treatise the next explains the mystery of divine faith in such a manner that those who are to be baptized in the Father Son and the Holy Spirit may understand the true nature of the names and not confuse the meaning of the words but conceive each one as he is and he is named from the statements that are made they will realize very clearly that the true nature is appropriate to the name and the name to the true nature what does he mean he means that he wants those who are to be prepared in any place for baptism in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit to understand two things 
Firstly, that Father, Son and Holy Spirit must represent persons in the Holy Trinity. They must represent something which is real and cannot be just a mask that is worn by one God alone. Uh, secondly, he wants those who hear and read his teaching to understand that if the Father is God, then the Son must be God. Because the Son of such a Father, born or begotten from such a Father, must share the same nature. Equally, if the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of the Father and the Holy Spirit of the Son, then it is because he also must share the same divine nature, while also being uh, an identity, a person in his own right. It is interesting that in the preparation for baptism, theology in the mind of St. Hilary is important. Uh, it's not enough just to learn uh, some of the ritual of the church. It's not enough just to learn uh, some of the basics of our beliefs. But this issue of the Holy Trinity is something which he wishes to be explained and which he will explain himself even to those who are being prepared for baptism. Uh, and in a way that is simple, in a way that is easy to understand, it seems to me that we must also teach the truth of the Holy Trinity. Because it is very easy for even the members of our own church, uh, especially young people or those not very well instructed, to believe either that there are three gods, or to believe that in some way Jesus isn't quite God in the same way as the Father. And even that the Holy Spirit isn't really a person, but some vague influence. Uh, the theology of the Church, our understanding of the Holy Trinity, uh, and of Christology, of who God the Word is, who Jesus Christ is, is a necessary aspect of our teaching for those we are preparing for baptism, if we are in the West and dealing with uh, adult converts, but also a necessary aspect of our teaching and training of our own youth so that each of them are grounded in the apostolic faith and not in any false ideas about God. About book three he says, then after a simple and brief description of the Trinity, book three although slowly still continues to make progress. That which the Lord revealed about himself as being beyond the comprehension of the human mind as when he says, I in the Father and the Father in me, he adapts to the understanding of faith by the greatest possible examples of his omnipotence. So that which man does not grasp because of his sluggish nature may be now obtained by the faith of a reasonable knowledge. Because we must believe God when speaking about himself and must not imagine that the understanding of his power is beyond the reasonableness of faith. So in the next chapter, he will go on to describe in a simple way the Holy Trinity. Uh, and it is surely worth us studying that ourselves in our own time in detail so that we also gain the benefit of this simple and brief description of the Holy Trinity. What is important here, though, is that he makes a distinction, we can say, between intellectualism and faith. Not that faith is unreasonable because he speaks about having a reasonable faith. And I believe I have a reasonable faith. There are reasons for my faith. But I do not have an intellectual faith where God somehow has had to prove himself in every way to me. Uh, I know that my wife loves me and I have faith that she loves me. And my faith in her love is reasonable because it is built on experience and on the revelation of her love to me. But I have not put it under a microscope, uh, nor measured it in some way, in, in a survey or in some sort of an experiment. And in the same way here, in book three, St. Hilary will go on to show us that our faith goes beyond our intellect. And there are things that Christ says, I in the Father and the Father in me which we cannot fully comprehend, and our intellect has to remain silent. But with the reasonableness of faith, we believe that this is true, and that Christ is in the Father, and the Father is in Christ, even though with our mind and the limitations of our understanding, we cannot completely express what that means. And then about Book 4. Book 4 then begins with the doctrines of the heretics, 
and is not tainted with those defects by which the faith of the church is brought into evil repute. It cites that very explanation of their unbelief, which many of them issued only recently, and denounces them for defending the one God from the law in a sly and therefore in a most godless manner. From all the evidence in the law and the prophets, it is shown to be blasphemy to acknowledge the one God without Christ as God, and a lack of faith not to proclaim the one God after asserting that Christ is the only begotten God. So in book four, he's going to begin to start wrestling, especially with the teachings of the Arians. Uh, and we can see in this passage that he's speaking about uh, a declaration of faith which the Arians have only just made. So this isn't a teaching or an error which is just historical and of no great importance. He is struggling here to express the truth about God in the faith of, face of real opposition. Uh, and this is the struggle we always find ourselves in. Uh, perhaps especially in the West, but also in every country where we are seeking to be faithful to the Orthodox tradition. There will always be those in every place uh, who provide an influence of error to ourselves and to our youth. Uh, and we must struggle against them uh, because their teachings will take what we have, the scriptures and the fathers, and will twist them and make them defective uh, and deny the reality of God and of Christ which we proclaim. Uh, and the Arians especially were denying that the word of God was truly God. And the, the slogan of the Orthodox faith which made them stand apart and which brought so much persecution upon them was that the word of God, Jesus Christ, is the only begotten Son of the Father. Uh, which we read and say very often in the creed. The Arians were able to say that the word was the son of God, meaning that he was related to God in some way. They were unable and unwilling to say that he was the only begotten son of the father. Because to be only begotten means that he has the same nature as God and is God himself. Uh, and so here there is... It seems to me a necessary need, even in our own teaching today, to deal with the heresies which we find around us. Not always quite the same. There are modern Arians. The Jehovah's Witnesses are Arians uh, and, and profess the same defects, the same idea that Jesus, God the Word, is not truly God. Uh, but generally speaking, our youth uh, and those who are influenced by outside false teachings need us to be very clear in expressing what it is that our orthodoxy proclaims and how it is that these other beliefs are defective and will fail to produce in us the fullness of the life of Christ. Uh, His Holiness Pope Shenouda wrote a very useful book uh, of comparative theology uh, and in a very short space he discussed uh, many of these uh, teachings which are found ar around us and we do not have to believe that those who uh, preach them are bad people at all. Uh, just like even Arius, we can believe that they are people who are trying in their own strength to make sense of the Christian message, but they go astray. Uh, but it is necessary for us, for the safety and salvation of our youth especially, uh, that we produce more books in the same way as Pope Shenouda produced his, explaining to our own members of the church uh, how it is that these other ideas are not properly orthodox and therefore not properly Christian. And then in book five he speaks and says, in book five however, when replying to the heretics, we have followed the order which they adopted in their profession of faith. Since they misrepresented the teaching that there is one God according to the law, they were also guilty of self-deception when they concluded from it that there is only one true God. So that by isolating the one true God, they would deny the birth of Christ our Lord. For though there is a birth, the possession of a true nature is understood. From the prophetical books, we have established that he possesses the true nature of the Godhead. Uh, again, he's going to continue in book five to consider the error of the Arians 
What is important here is that he is going to look at the statement of faith which the Arians have produced. Uh, he is not relying on hearsay. He's not relying on gossip. Uh, he is going to turn respectfully, we can say, to their own statement of faith and examine what they have said themselves so that he can show that they are not consistent with the faith which we find in the Orthodox Church and which is expressed in the books of the Old and the New Testament. Uh, they believed when they read the Old Testament that they could find only one God, God on his own. And so that transformed the way they looked at everything else. They were self-deceived. Uh, and so even when speaking about the Arians, uh, he is able to say, St. Hilary is able to say, they are also deceived. They have deceived themselves. And therefore we can have some sympathy for them. Uh, it is not as if they are deliberately choosing something wrong, but they have become deceived by their own wrong assumptions. What does he do? He returns again to the books of Scripture, to the prophetical books, uh, the same books which the Arians read, and he discovers there that the Word of God possesses the true nature of the Godhead and is God together with the Father, so that there is in God a Father and a Son and Word and a Spirit. And these three, even in the Old Testament, if we read it carefully and properly, uh, we discover the truth about God and about Christ. And then he says, in book 6, we now reveal the complete duplicity of this heretical declaration. In order that their own words might be believed, they condemn the statements and mistakes of the heretics, Valentinian, Sabellius, Manni and Hierarchus, and have stolen the pious beliefs of the church as a disguise for their own impious teachings in order that they might suppress the pious doctrine under the pretext of disapproving impiety. Thus we conclude that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God, which they especially deny. What he's saying here is that one of the methods of those who teach heresy is to take some error, some bad error, obvious error of someone else, and in appearing to reject it, introduce their own error. And so Valentinian, Manny, for instance, uh, they believed that there were two equal and opposite forces, a good God, as it were, and a bad God, and that these were constantly fighting. And the reason that there was evil in the world is that the bad God ruled this world. And the way that we could make our way out of this evil place was to become spiritual people in their own understanding so that we could escape back to be with the good God. There was very little uh, of our Christian orthodoxy in the teachings of such men. And it was easy for the Arians to reject these ideas and say we don't believe in one or two or three or four gods, multiple gods. Uh, we don't believe in a good God and a bad God. We believe only in one God. Uh, and yet by disapproving the errors of other heretics, they were introducing their own error. Uh, so that those who were simple-minded might say, hear how clearly they re reject and resist these errors, uh, their teaching must be true. And this also is something we have to teach carefully to our youth and be aware of ourselves. Just because someone is very clear in their opposition to one error, doesn't mean that everything else they say is of the truth and is not introducing error of another kind. Uh, and we found this in the 19th century when the Protestant missionaries uh, came to Egypt and started teaching our children. Uh, they spoke in one way to the hierarchs of our church uh, and said that they wished to help educate us in the scriptures and in the understanding of the Christian uh, teachings. And that sounded very important and helpful and necessary. But while they were doing this, they were introducing Protestant ideas, which influenced many of our children and youth in the 19th centuries. We must be very careful that when we take help from one person, because it seems that they have the same faith as us in one respect, that we are very clear that in every other respect, they have the same faith as us. Otherwise, we will discover that they are introducing whether they mean to in a bad way or not, false teachings into our church. 
And because we have accepted them as being of the same faith as us, because of one thing, uh, even more dangerously, their errors uh, are able to come into the church and affect those around us, and especially our youth. Uh, in, especially in the modern times, we have to be very careful that while we are uh, in fellowship with very many who love our Lord Jesus, that fellowship does not mean that we open the door for them to be able to teach in our churches and to teach our youth. Because in this way, false ideas, non-orthodox ideas, are very easily able to enter into the life of our church. And then book seven. Book seven next directs the tone of the discussion which we have undertaken according to the standard of the perfect faith. After a sound and frank exposition of the unassailable faith, it joins in the quarrel between Sabelius and Ebion and those who do not proclaim the true God and asks why Sabelius denies his existence before the world. The church testifies against Sabelius, against those who recognize him only as a creature and against Ebion that the Lord Jesus Christ is the true God and from the true God born before the ages and afterwards begotten as man. What he's going to do in chapter 7 is turn away from Arianism for a while and he's going to start looking at the teachings of Sabelius and Ebion uh, who were two of the early originators of heresy and their particular heresy we can say especially as St Hilary is describing it was to say that Jesus Christ was only a man. He was only a man who was influenced by God in some way. And so just as we might say, for instance, that uh, Pope St. Kirillos was a son of God because we saw all the good things he did, you know, uh, and we saw that God spoke to him uh, and we saw that there were miracles performed through him. In the same way, Sibelius and Ebion would have said of Jesus, even more than Pope St. Kirillos, he is a son of God because God is at work in him. But just as we would not say of Pope St. Kirillos that he was begotten of the Father before all ages and he was not God himself, so Sabelius and Ebion also denied that the Lord Jesus Christ was truly God in any way at all. He was a man. Uh, he was a man born of a man and a woman and he died on a cross and he was buried in a tomb, uh, whatever the differences in what they thought happened afterwards. But he was only a man. He was a man who was influenced by God. Uh, and this is another heresy which we find in our own times. Uh, there are many, especially in the West, uh, who want to say that Jesus Christ was only a prophet, only a teacher. And we should take his words and apply them as best we can. Be nice to everybody, love people, be kind and generous. Uh, but this was not the true message of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ is God himself. And as St. Hilary says, he is the true God from the true God. And our Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God made man, uh, exists in eternity before creation. Uh, always as the Son and word of God, uh, together with the Holy Spirit, one holy trinity, sharing one substance and nature and essence. If we allow our youth and ourselves even to begin to think of Jesus as just a teacher and just a prophet. Uh, then our salvation collapses because we no longer have any possibility of being united with God. We have only the possibility of learning from his example <coughs> and trying in our own strength to be a good person or a better person. Uh, the religion of Sibelius and Ebion is moralism. It's a list of things that we should do and it's a list of things we should avoid. But Christianity is not a list of things we should do and things we should avoid. Uh, Christianity is the giving of our whole life over to Christ so that in unity with him and by the power of the Holy Spirit we are truly made sons of God by grace with the divine life of the Holy Spirit working within us so that we are brought into uh, a perfect and personal union with God as far as our humanity allows. We do not become members of the Holy Trinity. Uh, we are not son of God by nature as uh, the word of God is the son of God by nature. But we truly become sons of God by grace so that he is our father and we can pray our father 
who art in heaven. For Sibelius and Ebion, uh, for whom Jesus was just a good man, a good teacher, a prophet, uh, there is no possibility of any meaningful sonship uh, for men and women on earth. We can only do our best to follow his example. And there is no salvation in that. We have been trying to follow the example of good men for the last thousands and thousands of years. And then in book eight, oh sorry, I want to read one more small chapter from book seven. Since on the authority of the law and the prophets, we had first proclaimed him as the son of God, and later on as also the true God in the mystery of unity, no one doubts that it is very much in harmony with the doctrine of godliness for the Gospels to give added confirmation to the law and the prophets and to teach from them. First of all, that he is the Son of God and afterwards that he is also the true God. It was therefore most fitting that after giving the name of the Son, we should reveal his true nature. Although according to the common opinion, the title of Son is a clear indication of the true nature. What do we find here? He's saying again, if we go back to the scriptures if we go back to the old and new testament then we see that first of all he is proclaimed as the son of god not in a way that answers every question in the old testament but already we find him as the son of god spoken of by the prophets and then as he reveals himself through the scriptures through the gospels and then as we read the old testament again with the words of the gospels in our mind we realize that he is true god he is son of God because he is true God. And it is no longer just a title that is given him, a name, but it is a nature that belongs to him. And indeed, we come to realize that if he is truly the son of God, it must be because he shares the same nature as his divine father. Uh, then in book eight, he says, book eight is entirely concerned with the evidence for the one God. It does not eliminate the birth of the son, neither does it admit the divine nature in two gods. It has first informed us of the methods whereby the heretics seek to avoid the true nature of God the Father and God the Son by exposing their ridiculous and absurd evasions. While we consider the whole contents of the Lord's words, from the statements of the apostles and the properties of the Holy Spirit, we have taught the complete and perfect mystery concerning the majesty of the Father and the only begotten Son. So in book 8, he is going to talk about the one God, because that is something that concerns the Arians, the Sibelians, the Ebionites, the Modalists. Everyone is concerned with preserving the idea of the one God. But what he wants to do is explain how, in an orthodox manner, firstly, it does not prevent us speaking of the Word and Son of God begotten from the Father, Neither does it mean that if we speak of the Son and Word of God, that there are two gods. And he explains in chapter 8 how it is, how the unity of God is preserved, even though the diversity of persons in the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, are expressed and are real and not masks worn by the one God. How is he going to do this? It is not by focusing on little bits here and there as the Arians and the heretics do. Uh, we can be sure that there is something wrong when someone just takes a piece here and a piece here and a piece there to prove their arguments. What St. Hilary insists is required and what he will do in his own argument is to consider the whole contents of the Lord's words uh, and everything that is said in the Holy Scriptures so that he can present a complete and perfect mystery. He doesn't want to miss anything out just so that his argument is made more solid. He wants to understand the length and the breadth of the scriptures so that in them he finds everything that is said about God, everything that is said about the Trinity in the Old and the New Testament. And it is only in giving himself and only as we give ourselves to the whole of the scriptures and, and to a great deal of the patristic explanation of the scriptures that we come to a complete and perfect understanding as far as it is possible for our limited mind of the majesty of the Father and his only begotten Son. As soon as we limit ourselves and think I will only read here and there, then we are working with the intellect and we are only seeking to prove our own argument 
instead of submitting ourselves to God in the scriptures and the fathers. The whole of Book 9 is devoted to refuting the testimony which these impious men have used to undermine the birth of the only begotten God. Unaware as they are of the mysterious plan of salvation that has been hidden since the beginning of the world, and who do not recall that the faith of the gospel proclaims him as God and man, the same individual is author, also the author of both statements. So in Book 9, he is going to start speaking about how it is that Jesus Christ is both God and man. Because this is necessary for our understanding of the Holy Trinity, since we insist that Jesus Christ is truly God, and it is also necessary for our salvation, since we insist that God the Word has become truly man, without changing who and what he is. Uh, again, St. Hilary finds that this plan of salvation is found throughout the Scriptures. Uh, it doesn't require us to have a philosophical understanding. It doesn't require us to come up with complicated arguments in our mind. But as we read the scriptures, as we read the prophets, as we read the gospels, the words of the Lord himself, and the teaching of St. Paul and the other apostles, we understand that this has been the purpose of God from the beginning. That he himself, as God the Word, should become man as Jesus Christ for our salvation. And so when we see words spoken by Christ, some of which seem to be the words of a man and some which seem to be the words of God, uh, St. Hilary, writing in the 4th century, uh, after the time of Nicaea, is entirely confident that these represent the words of one individual. Uh, there is not God the Word and Jesus the man, and they are somehow living together. Uh, God the Word is not influencing Jesus the man. But the words which Jesus speaks, both words which belong to God and words which belong to man, are both of the same individual, the Son and Word of God, who has become man while remaining who he is, Jesus the Christ. And then in Book 10, he's coming to the close of his work. The arrangement in Book 10 is the same as that in the faith itself. Since they have distorted certain things about the nature of the Passion and statements made about it during the comprehension of them in a foolish manner, for the sake of lessening respect for the divine nature and power in the Lord Jesus Christ, so we must bring out that they have placed a most godless construction upon them, and they were mentioned by our Lord as a testimony to the true and perfect glory that is his. If you turn to this passage in Book 1, where he speaks a book about Book 10, and if you turn to Book 10 in the wider book, you will see that he is speaking about all the things that happened around our Lord's uh, crucifixion and death. Uh, and for someone uh, who did not believe in the Orthodox message, this was a scandal. How could it possibly be said that God had wept? How could it possibly be said that God had said, if it be possible, let this cup be taken from me. How could it po be possible that God himself could be beaten and whipped and a crown of thorns placed on his head and men spit on him and he be nailed to a cross? Uh, it seemed impossible to those who believed that there was one God, that all of these things could happen uh, to the deity himself at all uh, under any circumstances. And so in Book 10, St. Hilary goes on to explain how it is necessary uh, and how it is that Christ himself explains these things. That as a man, being God made man, he experiences all of these things, all of this suffering, uh, the death that was due to us on our behalf, so that as a man, God made man, he might destroy the power of death, uh, rise from death in his own humanity, and grant resurrection to us uh, who were bound in bondage to Satan and sin and death all of our life. Uh, so he's coming towards the end of his book to focus more and more positively on what it is that our Orthodox faith teaches and how it is that these heresies diminish the faith. Uh, they don't provide a better example. They miss out something of great importance at every stage by trying to be too intellectually perfect in every way. It is a scandal to say 
that God was nailed to the cross. But Orthodox Christians believe this, that the one who was nailed to the cross is God the Word himself. Not nailed in his divine nature. The divine nature cannot be seen or touched. Uh, it cannot be beaten. It cannot have nails put through it. It is not a thing at all. But he became man and was truly God the Word made man so that he might suffer and die on our behalf. And any heresy that diminishes this in any way uh, takes away our salvation completely. Uh, and this is why St. Hilary is writing so many words in such a big book uh, because those in the West who are accepting these heresies of Arius and Sibelius are, are not other Christians who just have a difference of opinion. They are people who are destroying and rejecting and opposing the message of salvation itself. Uh, and then he speaks about Book 11. Because subjection testifies to the weakness of the subject and indicates the power of the ruler, Book 11 is also concerned with these questions and discusses them with the most thorough explanation of godliness. These very words of the Apostle not only do not lead to any weakness of the divinity, but reveal the true nature of the God who is born from God, from the fact that his Father is our Father and his God our God, we gain much and nothing is taken away from him since he was born as man and endured all the sufferings of the flesh he ascended to our god and father in order that in our manhood he might be glorified into god this is really the end of his book and he wants us to see why it is necessary that jesus christ is god himself made man and so none of the ideas which diminish the word of god are acceptable the word of God must be true God in the same way as the Father is true God and the Holy Spirit is true God. It must be God himself who is man as Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ must truly be man. There must be nothing missing about him. Uh, our sinfulness has nothing to do with our human nature. That is a fault of our will. Uh, there was no sin in Christ, but he became truly man. And in becoming man, nothing of his divinity was diminished. His, diminish, his divinity was not harmed in any way. Rather, everything was to our benefit and profit. We gained by God becoming man. And God did not lose anything himself uh, by becoming a man while he remained God. What was the purpose of all of these sufferings? Why was it necessary that God himself become a man? It was so that as he endured our sufferings on our behalf, and as he ascended to God in our humanity, we also are glorified in this humanity which he now shares with us. And we also may ascend to God, who now is our Father, as he is the Father of our Lord God and Saviour Jesus Christ, as he was always the Father in eternity of the Son and Word of God. Uh, in his words of conclusion, he says, we expose particularly the sophistry, the cleverness that is so prevalent because of the stupidity of worldly wisdom and which imagines that it is correctly stated about the Lord Jesus. There was a time when he was not and he did not exist before he was born and he was made out of non-existing things because birth seems to take for granted that he should receive being who did not possess it and that he should be born since he did not exist. So, again, in his conclusion, he draws out that most errors and heresies come about because people think they have cleverly found the right answer. Uh, if there is only one God, then there must be a time when the Son of God did not exist. Uh, and if he did not exist, then it was before he was born he did not exist. And if he did not exist, then he must have been made out of non-existing things. All of these things are found in people who rely on their intellect uh, to discuss the things of God. Uh, and when we allow only our intellect to be the judge and the guide and the rule uh, of what we say about God, then we find ourselves caught up in sophistry, uh, that foolish cleverness or the stupidity of worldly wisdom, because we think we have said something wise, but we have said something very foolish indeed. Contrary to this teaching of Arius, what is it that St. Hilary, in conclusion, 
uh, insists on his, his faith. We proclaim in accordance with the testimony of the apostles and the gospels that the Father always was and the Son always was. We shall teach that the God of all was not after some things but before all things. Certainly no one would dare any longer to follow the views of human reason and place the Holy Spirit in the ranks of creatures whom we would receive as a pledge of immortality and for a share in the divine and indestructible nature. So he says, first of all, this is my faith in conclusion. The Father always was, and the Son always was. There was not a before all things when the Son came into being. And when I want to speak of the Holy Spirit, St. Hilary says, uh, no one places the Holy Spirit among creatures. Even if we accept that God the Word, the Son of God, is truly God, neither will we allow it to be said that the Holy Spirit is only a creature. Because it is the Holy Spirit whom we receive in baptism. Again, he comes back to baptism and to those who are preparing for baptism. If you are going to receive the Holy Spirit, if it is going to be for you the gift of immortality and for a share in the divine life, then the Holy Spirit also must be God by nature. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit cannot give you immortality and a share in the divine and indestructible nature of God. This is why Arianism and Sabellianism fails. It is unable to give us a share in the divine life. Uh, it is unable to reveal to us the truth about the Holy Trinity. It is unable to allow us to enter into a relationship in eternity with God as the children, as the sons of God himself uh, in a human manner by grace. Uh, and finally, chapter one, actually, if you read it, book one, it ends with a doxology, a prayer. And I will read this last short passage from this prayer it is important that our theological reflection takes place in the context of prayer uh, how many of us writing an essay on theology would end with a doxology or a prayer to god and yet this is how saint hilary ends his first chapter before he begins his great explanation he turns to prayer and he invites his reader to turn to prayer so that everything in our investigation of God takes place in a spiritual and a prayerful manner. You are the eternal God, he says, the father of the eternal only begotten God, that you alone are without birth, and the one Lord Jesus Christ who is from you by an eternal birth, not to be placed among the number of the deities by a difference in the true nature, nor to be proclaimed as not being born from you, who are the true God, nor to be confessed as anything else than God, who has been born from you, the true God, the Father. It is necessary for us to return our theological reflections to God in prayer, that we express from our heart in prayer what it is that we have learnt, that God is magnified by our studies, that our greater and deeper understanding of the reality and truth about God drives us to prayer drives us to doxology and to praise. In this we know that our theological reflections are not from the intellect and the mind only, but are from the heart and are driven by the grace of the Holy Spirit who works in us to reveal God to us and draw us into a closer union with God to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.